Now let us take the next question. According to Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines 2021, which of the following statement is false? Q sofa can be used for screening of sepsis. Now let us take the next question. According to Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines 2021, which of the following statement is false? Q sofa can be used for screening of sepsis. Balanced crystalloids are preferred for fluid management. Noradrenaline is the vasopressor of choice. And the last one is target mean atrial pressure is 65 millimeters of mercury. Right? Okay. Now, every time you talk about uh, sepsis and you talk about the guidelines, guidelines primarily focus on three or four important areas. The area number one is with respect to initial management. And when I say initial management, it is about fluids, it is about antibiotics, and it is about uh, vasopressors if required. Right? These are the three areas which all the guidelines talk about. And the subsequent management, it is about the polished antibiotic policy. How do you manage the antibiotics in the subsequent phase? Initially, it is about what, what do you pick as empirical choice and what is the time frame for you to administer antibiotics in the emergency room? Okay, so in 2021 surviving sepsis campaign, there were a lot of changes incorporated. There are two important changes. The first important change is the recommendation was against the use of Q sofa as a sole screening tool for sepsis as opposed to physician's judgment. So now we are back to giving emphasis on physician's judgment rather than using Q sofa as a screening tool. The reason for that is Q sofa had led to overestimation of sepsis. Because Q-SOPA, in, in terms of achieving sensitivity, Q-SOPA was kind of diluted because it became more sensitive, but it lost its specificity. Right? So Q-SOPA was sensitive, but specificity was less. So a lot of patients who do not have sepsis were uh, evaluated for sepsis. Like in fact, any acute febrile illness or any infectious disease might give you a SOPA score, which might prompt you to think of sepsis. So because of that, the 2021 guidelines made this change. That was one change. The second change was the recommendation was against use of serum Procal. I am talking about Procalcitonin for decision making with respect to antibiotics. These are the two major changes. Right? So just let us quickly look into what are the major recommendations from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines 2021. The major changes as I have already told you, these two things are something that you have to remember because this will appear in MCQs. Recommendation against use of QSOFA as a screening tool for sepsis and recommendation against use of Procalcitonin as a guide for antibiotic treatment as opposed to clinical judgment okay so physicians are empowered in making antibiotic choice instead of procalcitonin good right okay now the other points we need to know is with respect to fluid resuscitation with respect to vasopressors and with respect to antibiotics these three things we will address now okay fluid resuscitation as such if you have a patient with sepsis you will be giving them fluids but resuscitation is a word that applies when you have septic shock or hypoperfusion so fluid resuscitation is indicated when there is septic shock or hypoperfusion now what is the difference between shock and hypoperfusion? That is what I was talking when I was discussing the option B in the last question. Definition of septic shock. Shock ideally is where you have hypotension, right? But hypotension sometimes can be masked. When there is circulatory failure occurring, still hypotension may be masked. Some of the counter-regulatory mechanisms might keep the BP within normal range, though the tissues may be hypoperfused, right? So this tissue hypoperfusion can be assessed by looking at serum lactate. In fact, 2021 guideline favors use of serum lactate as a marker of tissue hypoperfusion. If serum lactate is more than 2 millimoles per liter, that means there is ongoing hypoperfusion. Clear? Okay. So, when there is hypoperfusion or septic shock, fluid resuscitation is indicated and the fluid of choice is balanced crystalloids. What do I mean by balanced crystalloids? I have written here balanced crystalloids, not normal saline. Okay. The, the simple differentiation between the balanced and non-balanced crystalloids is non-balanced crystalloids though have the osmolality which is uh, similar to the plasma, they have, they do not have most of the components of the plasma. For example, uh, normal saline, it has only sodium and chloride, right? The balanced crystalloid is one which has, in addition to sodium and chloride, has additional electrolytes which are normal components of plasma. For example, your RL. RL is a typical example of balanced crystalloids. So the fluid of choice is balanced crystalloids and not unbalanced crystalloids, right? Clear. So we are not supposed to use normal saline when we have a patient with sepsis or septic shock. We are supposed to use RL or other similar balanced crystalloids. Okay. Now, the initial fluid load, initial fluid load, initial fluid load is recommended to be given at 30 ml per kg. This is like loading, right? When you are trying to do fluid resuscitation, we have to load the patient with fluids and that is around 30 ml per kg to be given in first three hours, to be given in first three hours. So, you have a patient with sepsis and septic shock or hypoperfusion as evidenced by serum lactate elevation 
you will be giving him 30 ml per kg. So for example, if you're dealing with a 50 kg person, you have to give around 1.5 liters of fluid in three hours. So essentially that becomes 500 ml per kg, sorry, 500 ml per hour for next three hours. If you are a, if you're having a 60 kg person, it becomes 1.6 liters, sorry, 1.8 liters. So you will be, you will end up giving around 600 ml per hour for next three hours, right? So that is the initial fluid load. A lot of MCQs have been asked about this point and this is not changed from the previous guideline. Okay. Last point is particularly important for us to remember recommendations favor measurement of blood lactate. Right. Okay. This is I have discussed the objective behind that. Okay. Now the second thing you have to note is once you start loading the fluid you have to assess the adequacy of fluid therapy and the recommendations favor use of dynamic measures over static measures for the adequacy of fluid therapy. What are those dynamic measures? A typical example I can tell you is passive leg rising test. This is a dynamic measure. Right? If passive leg rising is increasing the blood pressure, that means there is still scope for additional fluid therapy. Right? So dynamic measures are favored over your static measures. And remember the important dynamic measures. Your passive leg rising test, stroke volume, stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation, etc. These are examples. Okay. And for assessment of adequacy of perfusion, th these, these dynamic measures are for assessment of adequacy of Fluid therapy, despite good fluid therapy, there may not be perfusion at, uh, achieved, right? Good perfusion may not be achieved. So for assessment of adequacy of perfusion, capillary refill time is the recommended mode, right? So these are all MCQ point. What is the method for assessing the adequacy of perfusion? That is capillary refill time. What is the method, recommended method for assessment of adequacy of fluid therapy? That is dynamic measures like passive leg raising test or stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation, right? Okay, so what is the fluid of choice it is the balanced crystalloids like rl what is the initial loading fluid it is 30 ml per kg what is the time frame to complete the loading of fluids it is three hours right okay so these are all mcq points now coming to the antibiotic guidelines now antibiotic timing is very very important and the choice is also equally important so the timing depends whether the sepsis is clearly definitely sepsis or it is a probable case or sepsis is possible when the sepsis is definite or probable now what do i mean by that when you have already have a documented infection and your SOFA score has risen by two points, it's clearly a definite sepsis case. You are suspecting high likelihood of infection. Infection is not documented, but your SOFA score transition of two points has definitely occurred. Then you can call it as probable case. Now, other circumstances where you have other possible explanations for similar presentation, like sepsis is one of the differential diagnoses, and you have other possible uh, differential diagnoses, then you call you can call it as sepsis possible. When sepsis is the main condition that explains patient's uh, situation, then it is sepsis definite or probable, right? So when sepsis is definite or probable, within one hour of recognition or in simple words, within one hour of patient walking into the emergency room, antibiotics should be administered, clear? So one hour is the time limit for you. Now, if sepsis is possible, what, what we're talking about, the possible sepsis with other possible differential diagnosis still open, in that case, we're looking at whether there is shock present or no shock. If shock is present, treat it like sepsis definite or probable, right? So give antibiotics within one hour. You cannot take a chance. Shock may be explainable by other possible circumstances, like other possible differentials, like maybe cardiac failure or something. But still, please do not take a chance. Give antibiotics within one hour. But if patient is not in shock, you have three hours limit. In this three hours time, try to evaluate for the infection. So main thing is decide about infection versus no infection. Right. If you are able to conclude by clinical judgments and looking at some basic lab parameters that this is an infective case or non-infective case. If it is non-infective case, then do not initiate antibiotics. But by three hours time, it is clear that it is a case of sepsis. There is evidence of infection to think of. Right? In that case, give antibiotics within three hours. But three hours is your ceiling point. At the end of three hours, if you are undecided about whether it is infection versus non-infection, give up the antibiotics. Initiate antibiotics. And once you once the clarity emerges, then you can decide whether you need to continue antibiotics or not. And please remember, serum procalcone is not favored in this decision making. It is all clinical judgment. Taking a good history uh, and also like taking a little chance with your judgment rather than depending on serum procalcone and level. Like, so in, in all this, we used to follow serum procalcone levels, but now guidelines do not favor it. Clear? Okay, so that was about antibiotic guidelines. Now, the choice of antibiotic, the empirical initial choice, obviously, once the culture report comes, you are further managing according to what culture sensitivity pattern says. But in terms of initial choice, we all know that gram-negative infections are responsible for majority of cases of sepsis, right? They account for more than 60% of cases of sepsis are because of gram-negative organisms. So, there is emphasis on gram-negative coverage whenever you have a patient with sepsis and septic shock, right? So, gram-negative coverage, you generally try to treat with one antibiotic 
that is the usual recommendation single antibiotic but if there is a risk of multi drug resistant organisms for example someone who had been hospitalized and who was having indwelling catheters and you're suspecting that that is a source of infection like for example there is a urinary catheter and patient is in sepsis and you are suspecting that the folies may be responsible in that case it is most likely e coli most likely esbl producing e coli so we are concerned in that case use mdr in the in the case use two antibiotics to cover the gram negative organism the patient is at low risk of having mdr infection like a community acquired infection no other major comorbidities no immunosuppressed situations then preferably try to treat with one antibiotic only right so you are picking up one antibiotic which is active against gram negative in the absence of mdr risk factors if the mdr risk factors are present we are using two antibiotics okay then whether we need to add an mrsa coverage or a strong gram positive coverage again that depends on patient risk factor if patient has risk factors for mrsa recent hospitalization healthcare associated infections l yes yes in that case you need to add mrsa coverage right okay and about the antifungals antifungals are indicated if patient has risk factors for fungal infection like hiv positive individuals diabetics patients with indwelling catheters particularly the the central lines if if that is a situation you might have to cover antifungals clear so the backbone of the antibiotics for sepsis management is gram negative coverage you add gram positive coverage if required you add antifungals if required this is what the 2021 guidelines talk about clear okay now coming to the vasopressors of choice if patient is in septic shock or if there is evidence of hypoperfusion by looking at the lactate and despite adequate fluid hydration you are not able to achieve the target mean arterial pressure i'll come to what is the target mean arterial pressure if you are not able to achieve the target mean arterial pressure you are compelled to start inotropes so what is the first vasopressor of choice the first vasopressor of choice is noradrenaline because it gives us the sweet spot in the sense like when you are trying to use dopamine and all they have a predominant chronotropic action they are good inotropes but they are predominant chronotropes also so they are increasing the heart rate they are improving the blood pressure but they are also increasing the heart rate this increases the heart rate we have a problem with that because whenever heart rate increases the diastole shortens there is reduced myocardial perfusion because myocardium is primarily perfused during the diastole so the end result is your cardiac dysfunction worsens because it is not being perfused adequately right so we do not want to use dopamine so dopamine doesn't find a major place right no major role for dopamine okay until and unless you have a patient who is in bradycardia you may choose dopamine to manage his uh, inotropic uh, manage his hypotension so in that case like even if you follow the bradycardia algorithm by acls like you will acls 2020 you will end up choosing dopamine there like you have the freedom to choose dopamine in that case bradycardia with hypotension you can use dopamine but otherwise in a in a situation where you are making a general decision first choice is noradrenaline noradrenaline is the first choice now please again pay attention the recommendation is that you start with a stipulated dose so there is there is dose advised based on the weight i don't think we need to remember numbers but we are starting the noradrenaline at that dose on the prescribed dose if noradrenaline is not able to achieve the mean arterial pressure then you do not up titrate the noradrenaline so there is no titration with respect to the inotropic agents you just start at the prescribed dose if there is uh, no achievement of the mean arterial pressure you just add the second agent right so you start with noradrenaline if you are not achieving the mean arterial pressure you add second choice the second choice is vasopressin clear okay with respect to vasopressin there were mcqs from the on the critical care medicine nitsis also about through which receptor it exerts its vasopressor activity that is v1 which is also known as v1a v1a so Uh, v1 receptors or v1a receptors are expressed on the smooth muscle cells of the blood vessels so when vasopressin stimulates v1a receptors it causes the contraction of smooth muscle cells can you tell me any other drug that works through the same receptors and causes hypotension yes you got it right so that is coniveptan right so coniveptan is a non selective vasopressin antagonist your tolveptan is a selective selective in the sense it it is selectively acting on v2 receptors so it is only regulating water balance but your coniveptan acts through v2 receptor it inhibits v2 receptors it also inhibits v1a receptors so because it is inhibiting v1a receptors on the smooth muscle cells it can cause vasodilatation and it can cause hypotension so hypotension is a side effect coniveptan is a drug which is administered as iv infusion in the hospital and patients can have the risk of hypotension clear okay the third choice is adrenaline so if after starting the prescribed dose of noradrenaline if to, if after starting the prescribed dose of vasopressin still mean arterial pressure target is not achieved then you can add adrenaline all at prescribed dose there is no role of titration 
you can down titrate when you are deciding to stop the inotropes but there is no role of up titration right is that clear okay so this is the point to note surviving sepsis campaign guidelines recommend initiating noradrenaline at prescribed dose as first choice prescribed dose at first choice if desired map is not achieved recommendation favors adding vasopressin instead of escalating noradrenaline dose clear okay now the last point the target mean arterial pressure the target mean arterial pressure is 65 millimeters of mercury okay so recommendation is to maintain map around 65 millimeters of mercury rather than high map so previously guidelines used to say the target map is more than 65 millimeters of mercury but it also ended up in many physicians trying to achieve a mean arterial pressure of 80 85 or like higher readings and that was associated with some negative outcome so keeping that in mind they say around 65 it's like don't try to keep much higher just around 65 close to 65 65 plus but close to 65 around 65 to 75 65 to 70 millimeters of mercury right okay now the next point is with respect to the management of the other complications if hypoxia is there there is a recommendation to use high flow nasal oxygen and if the patient has developed ARDS as a consequence of sepsis then the ventilator strategies are kind of similar to the ventilator strategies generally we talk about in case of ARDS not much difference there so keep in mind we are following the low tidal volume high peep strategy keeping the plateau pressure under 30 millimeters of mercury so that we are minimizing the risk of barotrauma and we are following a high peep strategy over low peep high peep strategy over low peep now some of us do have this confusion of high peep versus low peep what do we think is like low peep means we keep the peep low and high peep is like we keep the peep high no that's not the scenario even in low peep approach if there is a need for increasing peep you can increase up to the maximum permissible limit but the point is you start with the lowest peep and build up additional peep if required in case of high peep strategy you start with some moderately high peep and escalate further if required right so most cases what we do is in low peep strategy we are starting at 5 and escalating up to 24 so 24 is the permissible limit in high peep strategy generally we start at 12 and escalate up to 24 if required so the starting point is 12 that is the difference and the recommendations favor in case of ARDS recommendations favor high peep strategy because we want to have the alveoli open we don't want them to be going through collapse and collapse and open collapse and open right so high peep strategy is favored now in the 2020s and 2021s we learned a lot about management of ARDS because a lot of COVID cases happened and that gave, an, gave us an insight, right? So currently, there is recommendation for prone ventilation. So prone ventilation is recommended in moderate ARDS defined by Berlin criteria. So we have Berlin criteria for definition of ARDS defined by Berlin criteria. If there is moderate ARDS, the recommendation is at least 12 hours of proning per day. 12 hours of proning per day. Okay. And with respect to ECMO also, previously, even in my video module, I had told that there is insufficient evidence that ECMO reduces mortality so guidelines do not favor it but COVID gave us sufficient evidence to say that ECMO impacts the mortality in severe ARDS patients so there is recommendation for veno venous ECMO in severe ARDS again defined by Berlin criteria right okay so those are the key updates that I want you to know now going back to the question what makes sense now Q so far can be used for screening tool absolutely no right it is false statement this is a false statement option A is false Option B, balanced crystalloids are preferred for fluid management. Yes, absolutely right. This is a true statement. Noradrenaline is a vasopressor of choice. Yes, noradrenaline followed by vasopressin followed by adrenaline dopamine doesn't find a place. And yeah, I forgot to tell you, dopamine can be used if you believe that there is contribution from the cardiovascular dysfunction towards the shock. Like you're dealing with a patient with shock, you're considering it to be septic shock, but you're also considering the contribution from the cardiovascular failure in that case. In, this, in that case, you can also use dopamine, right? Okay. Noradrenaline is a vasopressor of choice is a true statement and target map is 65 millimeters of mercury is a true statement. So, the right answer for us is option A. Q-SOFA can be used for screening of sepsis is false. No longer we should be using Q-SOFA as a screening tool for sepsis. Clear? Okay.